This podcast is made possible through donations from listeners like you and our partners at Tallman Equipment, where they pride themselves on equipping their customers with the tools they need to get the job done right. They are dedicated to set the standard for quality, convenience, and reliability. At Tallman, your opinion is important to them. Rate and review any product or tool you've used on their new website at tallmanequipment.com. Line 11 Clothing Company. Making apparel for our first responders with a positive message to patriots that you can be proud of. A proceed of the cost goes to helping our foundation ignite the fire for father engagement. Give them a follow at Line11Clothing on Instagram. And last but not least, Monzingo Knives. Each knife is created with craftsmanship that only a tradesman could provide. Find them on Instagram at Monzingo Knives and get your American-made Monzingo knife today. Welcome to the Show Up Dad. This is a podcast for hardworking fathers. At the Show Up Dad, we recognize that fathers providing for their children is certainly important. But when men truly understand their unique role and gain the knowledge and skills to be great fathers, they can transform and impact future generations. Our guest today is none other than David Powell. David is currently an owner and partner at Southeast Lyman Training Center, a nationally recognized trade school specializing in training electrical and communications line workers. He is also a co-founder and co-creator of Woodwalkers. This documentary series shares the real-life journey of men and women searching for a meaningful and rewarding career in the electrical utility industry. David has been married to his bride, Tammy Powell, for 21 years, and they have two boys, Preston, who's 18, and Hudson, who's 14. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thank you, David. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Can I have you open up by giving our listeners a brief history of your family of origin, if you don't mind, brother? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up in uh, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. Spent most of my childhood um, in the suburbs, of Birmingham. And um, you know, I think back, I have some really fond memories of those days uh, in the neighborhood. So like we'd run free and can pretty much do whatever we want to. We all had bikes. So we'd ride around on the neighborhood, visit all the, fr- visit everybody in the neighborhood, the friends. And we played uh wiffle ball just about every weekend or football or basketball. But um, it was just those times where, you know, doors were unlocked and cars were unlocked and we'd go in each other's houses and just, it was more like, a, it, was a, it was a true community, true family. Like all the parents knew all the kids. Um, but that's, uh, I was there till I was 12 years old. And then um, at 12, we moved from Birmingham to a town called Safford, Alabama. Safford's got a, it's got a stop sign and a, a yellow flashing light. So it's a hmm. tiny, small town outside of Selma, Alabama. And so um, obviously Selma in the history books is pretty, pretty popular for, for some, I guess, some not so great things, but I moved outside in Selma and we had, uh, what brought us there actually took us there is my, my stepdad, my parents were divorced when I was two. So, uh, my stepdad, uh, liked to deer hunt and he, um, would hunt outside of Selma and, uh, he found a piece of property and a house and thought that this would be a good transition for us from Birmingham, um, to Selma. And, and a lot of it might've been things that I didn't see, you know, in the marriage and, and, and so forth. But, he liked the idea of us being in the country. So we, we, uh, we picked up and, and we we're going to spend the summer out there. Just one summer is all we we're going to do. And we got out there, we spent the summer four wheelers and, you know, 1700 acres to, to roam on and, uh, ended up staying. I never went back to Birmingham and this was, I never said bye to my friends. We just, we were gone. There were a couple of friends that I stayed in contact with, but, um, yeah. So, so, uh, grew up, so spent high school years, I guess, um, some middle and high school in, uh, Safford. And, uh, like I said, it was about 20 miles outside of Selma and, um, was driving when I was 13 years old, taking out deer hunters. We had cows and horses and chickens and just a little bit of everything. We didn't really farm. We, um, again, primarily it was just for deer hunters. My dad would still drive back and forth to Birmingham. That was pretty much uh, an everyday trek for him. And then, um, and then I went to, uh, so I went to a, a private school there, Morgan Academy, uh, graduated Morgan, went to work, I went to school at Auburn University. And, um, you know, for me, now that I'm 
running a trade school uh, wasn't even something that I was even aware of, aware of back then. You know, it's like I figured I had two two options. Uh, number one is go to work right out of high school, uh, doing whatever, uh, go to college or go in the military. Mm-hmm. You know, I never really realized there was an option for you know, for trades. But I took that path and graduated Auburn and uh, went to work for Alabama Power Company. I uh, was there a short time before ended up uh, being at SLTC. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely an awesome path that you've grown through. I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about your relationship with your stepfather. Okay. Um, if you can kind of expand on that, you know, looking back, how good was it with him? Like, did he really take that role as your father to step into that role? Or what do you think? Yeah. So I, um, I had two dads. I mean, I I stayed in contact with my biological father as well. Mm -hmm. Um, they were two very different individuals. So my, um, uh, you know, you've probably heard the saying, it's not where you start, where you finish. So Mm -hmm. my stepdad didn't, didn't have the best start from the standpoint of being a father. Um, growing up there was, uh, uh, he had, he had, he had grown up from, from nothing. He had nothing when he was, uh, you know, growing up he was in Birmingham and, um, he started working for this company called nap sales. It was sales, uh, primarily like frozen foods and stuff like that, but, uh, packaged food, pre-packaged foods. And he, uh, worked his way up and ended up buying the company. And so, um, never went to college, um, just from work, hard work and, and, uh, then owning his own business. But it was a tough business for him. It was, you know, he was taking clients out all the time. Um, so he was entertaining a lot. He was drinking a lot. Um, and he was an alcoholic. So um, wasn't the best relationship early on in our, in my childhood. And might have been the reason why we moved away to kind of create some space for, for us and our family. Mm-hmm. But um, it was a tough kind of a, a military type, you know, father had high, really high expectations, um, not really big on feelings. Um, and, um, but I will say this, you know, towards the later end of his life, uh, things kind of changed. I think moving was one, one of the things that, um, that really helped him. Um, he sold the company, uh, and then we, uh, ended up, ended up working for the same company. He, he had actually, you know, he had not started, but bought and, um, and then ended up coming to know Jesus. So you know, the drinking went away, the smoking went away, and um, really started seeing his life change. Um, and it was a, it was a, a process. Um, a lot of those things that added to the process. So at, at the end of his life, he's no longer with us. Um, at the end of his life, you know, we had a, we had a really strong relationship, uh, cared deeply for him. Um, but I will say, for him, you know, as far as how he taught me and what he wanted to instill in me, the older I got, the more I could see it. So, mm-hmm. you know, as a kid, you know, the, the tough dad relationship, the father that's has these high expectations and, and kind of military style expectations, I guess, um, can be, can be tough. Um, I had a great mom. So mom was there for all the emotional needs, I guess. And um, but, but I could start to see as I was a father of my own, you know, what he was trying to instill in me, you mm-hmm. know, what he was trying to do, uh, how he's trying to prepare me kind of the, his, his purpose and point of being so hard on me. He, he cared for me. He loved me. He just wanted, he wanted to make sure I was going to be successful and, and, um, you know, could take on all the challenges that life was going to throw my way. So it ended up very, very well. And, um, with that relationship, my, my biological dad, um, lived about five hours away from us. So I would not see him, but about once a month and he would drive, but as far as commitment, he was a committed dad as well. Um, he would drive five hours, pick us up, drive us five hours back to North Georgia. We'd spend the weekend and then he would make that trip again. Uh, taking us home. So 10 plus hour round trip, um, each way to, to, uh, uh, there and back for a weekend to spend with him. And he consistently did that so that there was a relationship with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
so I had, I had two different, I had two dads that had two completely different styles. And I will say, I learned a lot from both of them, um, positive and negative on how to, and how to do things and, and how I want to be as a father. Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely seems that your biological father was definitely committed. I mean, driving like that, just to make sure he spent that quality time with you, that's being intentional. And that's something we talk about at the show up dad. Um, and with your stepfather, I mean, one of the things that I've heard over and over on our show is that they could only give you what they had, you know, and a lot of times as fathers, when we come into a situation where we don't know what to do, we tend to fall back on what we were taught, mm. you know? And for us growing up, right, I'm not saying it was good or bad or whatever, but for us as men, it, we have to look at it like, hey, I forgive my dad and he could only give me what he had and he meant the best. You know what I mean? That, that's something that I had to realize with my own dad because I like you, my dad was militant you know, <laughs> he was out yeah. of, he was out of control for real. <laughs> you know, I did a, I did a, I did a, uh, a study called quest for authentic manhood, Robert Lewis. It's, uh -huh. it's had some years on it, but in that study, um, Robert talks about, there's no dad that wakes up every morning thinking how he wants to ruin his son's life, you know, and, and ultimately you're exactly right. Ultimately dad wakes up and tries to do the best he can with what he has. And so the older I got, the more I realized that, and, um, and that, and that, that, that relationship really got a lot better. Honestly, once I, once I got out from underneath them, once I got it on my own and I started living on my own, there was just a lot less tension. And, um, I was kind of realizing I'm my own man and I don't, I'm not under, under that heaviness. Um, and that really helped us, uh, that really helped that relationship. But uh, I realized that too. I realized that he was doing the best he can. And I knew he loved me. He would tell me he loved me. And, and he, here's the thing too. It's, he was my stepdad, but he really, really, really wanted me to be his son. And I, and I knew that. I knew it bothered him. He didn't want to share me, you know? And um, so I knew how much he cared about me. I knew how much he loved me. Um, but there were a lot of things too that were very positive. I could talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things I learned um, from, my, from my stepdad. But, and that is you know, work ethic. Um, you know, we lived on a farm and he did not, there were no such things, as excuses. I would have buddies over. I would go out the night before, you know, maybe stay up a little bit too late, uh, with my friends and he didn't care. And that son came up, my butt was up and he, I had, I had friends that were still sleeping in the bed. He, he didn't care if they were sleeping in the bed, but you're not sleeping in the bed. He's a, we're up working, you know, we got work to do. Um, and so number one is just work ethic. Number two is doing things the right way. You know, how many times I had to repeat the same job until it was done according to his standards. So um, he really did instill a lot of work ethic. When I, I mentioned I was 13 years old driving a vehicle, I was, like I said, being on the farm, I'd take deer hunters out. So I had to get up with the deer hunters and um, when they're eating breakfast and communicate with them and talk to them and kind of keep conversation going, which for, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old kid is, uh, it's kind of challenging, but I learned how to communicate with adults really, really well. Um, and so there were a lot of things that I can take back and say, man, he was tough, but I'm, I'm grateful for those times and the things that he taught me. Um, he, uh, he may ended up making, I mean, he made good money as he, he bought his own, bought his own business and um, he bought the business he was working for. And uh, he liked nice, nice things. And so where he would go and buy something, like he would buy, like, I'll just think about guns. Like if you wouldn't go buy a gun and for, for, for any of the gun listeners, if there's any that listen, mm -hmm. he'd go buy a star with a Zeiss scope. You know, I mean, he's, 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 he's spending thousands of dollars on a gun. Mm -hmm. And my dad, who was a biologist, uh, who had all the, who had a, a master's degree in fisheries biology, was a biologist, worked for TVA, uh, worked for Alabama Power was the exact opposite. My dad would go and buy four guns for what my, you know, stepdad would buy one. He would, what he would spend on one, my dad would spend on, you know, four and not always quality, you mm -hmm. know, it's just quantity. So I, I learned from both of them, you know, really just how they did things and, you know, what I liked, 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of different things I was able to, to glean from both my dad and my stepdad. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you would share with your children looking now that you have this vast uh, uh, wealth of knowledge, you know, these experiences from two different dads, two different uh, fathering, you know, personalities, what would you share with your children or what do you share with your, your children now for both of them that you see yourself yeah. doing? Yeah. Well, it's so funny. Cause I can see, um, there were things that I will say are actions that I will take. And then all of a sudden I'm, I saw like a flashback to, to, to my dad. He was like, wait a second. That's what Roy sweat would have said. You know, that's how he would have responded or, or that's how Doug Powell does things. So, um, so with them, I think the work ethic is, is really big. My stepdad, you know, um, doing things the right way. Um, they're not worth, you know, details matter. It's a big part of what I teach to my boys is, is the importance of details and doing things the right way. And um, the, my dad being intentional, you know, I mean, he, he took, those, took those moments. I would not have a relationship with my dad had he not made the decision to make those trips because I had no option at that point. You know, I'm, I'm, I just had no option. Um, I couldn't drive or anything like that, but that actually kept our relationship, you know, strong. And as I got old enough to drive and ended up moving to Birmingham. So he was much closer to us. Um, I ended up living with him for a little while uh, after college. And so um, with, with, with that, I think being intentional with my boys work ethic with my boys, um, you know, uh, also just, again, how they did things, um, how they valued things, um, the importance of, of what they did when my stepdad, he was very committed. For, I mean, he's a very committed husband. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as he, he loved, he loved, he adored my, my mom. So I think I would want the boy, the boys that, how do you, you know, how do you treat a woman and you know, how did, how they treat their mom, how they're going to talk to their mom. Um, and uh, those are all things that, you know, again, my stepdad, I couldn't learn from my dad because they weren't together. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome that your father, your stepdad stepped up into that role and taught you what a, what a man is to a wife, you know, because that's one of the most important things we show our sons is that relationship. You know, that's something that we're going to take forever with us. That's how you're going to treat your wife. You know what I mean? And I think that's, that's, that's very stellar that he was able to do that. I mean, Nowadays, you don't really see too many men wanting to step into that role. And I got to take my hat off to him and commend him for that. Cause that's, that's a, those are some big shoes to fill brother. And it sounds that's like good. he did a, a great job. So um, with that being said, brother, thank you for sharing all that. I wanted to go into this transition, living your best life. Okay. I see that you're a coach and you truly have a heart and desire to help people out and grow people. You know what I mean? Um, I want to read you this quote. Pat Riley, the basketball coach, said that there are only two options regarding commitment. You're either in or you're out. There's no such thing as life in between. How do you view success, David? Yeah, so I think and one thing I'll say is I think success for everyone is a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. It all depends on their why. It all depends on what they're wanting in life. Um, and I look at, and I've, I've thought a lot about this question, you know, do I, you know, from a, because for the world, what the world tells us as far as successful, a lot of times is, you know, the Instagram or Facebook posts, you know, and, and the cars they drive, people, cars people drive, the things they have. And, um, but one of the things I learned uh, in my own journey is that um, I gauge success on four domains. Mm -hmm. Well, I look across body being balanced in business. So, you know, for, for me, um, if I'm to say, okay, how do I, how do I view success in my body? Um, it's really just staying healthy and getting as many miles out of, out of this you know, vessel that I can get. I, I always tell, um, I'm not a fan of, of, um, of weddings. Mm -hmm. I don't really like weddings because weddings are like, for the most part, people are young, naive, and uh, they think everything's going to just work out wonderful. And there's, you know, everything's going to be great. And it's a fairyland. You know, that's not the end. That's not where the story ends. That's where the story begins. But I love funerals. I love funerals of, of, of people's lives that have left a mark and left an impact. And I was at, a, um, I was at a, a recent funeral. And I hear the story of the life of this person. And 
and, and she had lived her life so full. And uh, I remember just sitting there going, you know what? I, I want, I want to finish so strong that my body is like, it's like, I've, it's like my vehicle. Like I've driven it till the wheels have fallen off. Mm -hmm. I want to push my body so well, so hard with obviously, but I want to do it in a way that I've like maximized that potential. So um, I have a quote from, um, we talked about a little bit earlier before we started the uh, buddy of mine, Lance Cumming, he's a 30 year retired Navy SEAL. And he has, he has a couple of favorite quotes. And, and one of them is, it's better to burn out than fade away. Hmm. And the other is, my, he said, my goal in life is to die young as late as possible. And, um, and I think just having that mindset of constantly pursuing, you know, I, I'm a, I see myself as an athlete. I'm an athlete. I was an athlete in college. I was an athlete, athlete in high school. And I'm an athlete today. I'm, you know, going to be, I'm 44 years old. But the way I look at it is I'm going to continue to pursue something to, to keep, you know, put something out there. To, it's going to constantly challenge me because I'm going to, I want to be an athlete. So from a body standpoint, how do I view success is, is that it's just getting the most out of what God's given me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so for being, um, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And so I want, I want to know that my, my you know, my life's mattered. I want to make an impact to, to the people that are around me. I want to know, I want them to look at my life and, and know, and I, and I can, I don't have to do this at the end of my life. I hope that I can look back recently and say, Hey, have I made an impact on people? Am I, am I changing people for the better? Am I, am I uh, an example? Am I leading them towards Jesus? Are they seeing, you know, love in my life? And ultimately it's to hear well done, you know, good and faithful servant. Yep. Uh, so that's the being side. The balance side is, um, you know, for my wife and my boys to know that I've given them everything I've, uh, everything I, I can, um, that I've invested in them, that I've equipped them for mm -hmm. life. Um, and, um, you know, and asking myself, constantly asking myself, um, and I asked my wife the other day, I'm like, I have to make sure that she doesn't feel second. You know, it's very easy for me to put work or put my own interest ahead of her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I did I asked for the question. I'm like, do you feel like you're second? Because you don't, you don't deserve to be second. And so I think constantly asking myself those questions, uh, in balance and then, and then business and, uh, you know, business from a success standpoint, it always ties to a lot. Most of the time it ties to bank account, but, um, the reality is like there's, and I can give a little bit of history of the school. I think we'll talk a little bit about that, but I've been here for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, when the school started, we were in a triple wide trailer and had 12 students in class. And so, you know, now we're, we've got four different locations, three, three full campuses, 300 students in class. Um, and at different times, there's been moments where I thought, well, I've, 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 I've made it, you know, it's successful. But then there's always somebody ahead of you. There's always somebody behind you, you know? And so it, it really boils down. If I had to like sum it up, it's really just knowing that I've, that I've grown and that I've given it everything I can and that I, that I have, mm -hmm. uh, that I haven't settled. And I don't think it's something like, Hey, I'm successful. I've reached the top of the mountain and it's done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I just don't think you ever stop. There's no finish line. You've heard that there's no finish line in life. You know, it's like, you just keep going, you know? So um, I think as long as you can look across those four domains and, and check yourself and ask yourself the serious question, you know, like, are you really doing good in those areas? And that's what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, David, David Goggins, um, uh, he has a book called can't hurt me. You don't know if you've read the book or heard of the book, but mm -hmm. David Goggins, a former SEAL, and he, he calls this thing the accountability mirror. And he goes, you got to look in the mirror. And I've heard another guy talk about it. He goes, strip down naked. You want to check your body? Strip down naked. Go look at yourself naked in the mirror and then tell me what you see. You know, it's like, are you happy? Like, are you happy with what you see? Like, but you just got to tell yourself the truth. And so in those areas, body being balanced of business, you got to look at that accountability mirror and you have to just, you have to ask yourself that tough question. Like, am I? Am I being successful in those areas? How do I, am I doing, am I doing great in those areas? 
Um, so that's, that's just daily a part of my life, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not a, it's not a, Hey, I've reached the top and, and now I'm successful and now I can rest and relax and, and enjoy my life. Eat, drink, mm -hmm. and be merry. That's just not how I roll. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, and, and I agree with you on each and every one of those points. Those are awesome that you shared that with us. Um, I took a bunch of notes on that. Um, and you're absolutely right. We can't let these challenges that we overcome be the pinnacle of our career. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if we do that, then we get comfortable. And I don't know how many guys I've had in here say the same thing. They got comfortable in the marriage. They got comfortable at the job and then an accident happened. You know what I mean? And Terry Crews, I think says it best. He had this one interview where he was talking about, he's like, if I'm comfortable, I'm scared. He's like, you don't want to be com comfortable because if you're comfortable, you're not growing and something right. bad is going to happen. You know what I mean? You got it. You know, you got to get used to that change. Change is growth. Change requires pain, you know, and one of the things they taught us in the military was pain is weakness, leaving your body. That's right. And it sucks, you know, but sometimes you just got to pay that man, you know? <laughs> and that's one of the things. And, you know, part of what I did, part of the lessons I've learned, um, I had one of my team members just was asking me even before this, before this call, you know, they were, they're asking about leadership and, and how you've learned what you've learned. And, you know, part of my journey was I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm not a veteran. You know, I, I never spent time in the military. So, but for some crazy reason at 30 something years old, I decided I wanted to go test myself. Mm -hmm. I surrounded myself with, with, uh, former SEALs and, and went through a you know, civilian training course because I wanted to learn. And there were things they taught me there that will forever be with me. Um, and just the value of, 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 you know, that leadership and that understanding that, you know, pain is weakness, leaving the body, you know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, you almost have to want to be uncomfortable, you know, embrace, mm -hmm. the suck. you know, all those things. Those are, those aren't just military terms. Those are life terms. Like if you, if you think about that in every aspect of your life, you know, success will follow. Mm -hmm. You're never resting and relaxing and getting comfortable, get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, that's another term you always hear. So um, I've just, I try to apply that consistently mm -hmm. uh, across those different areas. No, absolutely. Um, and you're right. You know, you, <laughs> that comfort, man, that'll, that'll get you. That's one thing I've learned, you know, cause I've gone complacent in my life. I've gone complacent in my marriage. I've gone complacent with my children, you know, and that's one of the things that spawned this whole movement of the show up that foundation. You know, I realized how, for lack of better words, crappy of a father and a husband I was, and I'm still going through it. You know, I'm still trying to, to make amends, you know, try to look in the mirror, and see, you know, why the reason why everybody wants to know why, you know, and when you look at yourself and you say, okay, what is the reason why I acted like this? Why did I do this to my family? You know, those are the deep questions that all these men need to ask themselves. And it's freedom, brother. It is. It's freedom. Once you get, it's going to hurt and it's going to be painful, but there's so much freedom to it. When you take ownership, like Jocko always talks about, he's always talking about ownership, you know, and once you start taking ownership for what you did, for what you caused, not saying necessarily that the other person is, you know, everybody has a choice and they're going to do what they're going to do, but how did you contribute to it? You know, that's freedom. It is know? freedom. You're exactly right. I mean, realizing that if, if that you have to take responsibility for everything, I, I had where I've, a friend of mine had a quote, um, no matter where you are in life, you've made an appointment to be there. Mm -hmm. I think taking, taking ownership, even if it's 0.01% of that, you know, from a relationship I had, my in-laws got divorced was probably one of the toughest times, um, in my life because we were so close to my in-laws and, you know, it was, it was, it was a moment where my mother-in-law did not like me. And I don't know why she didn't like, she just, she just was having a tough time because I would not, I would not just turn my back on my father-in-law. It was his fault. No, no doubt. hundred percent. But I told her, I was like, until you, until you take any, until you take responsibility for whatever that may be 0.01% of that responsibility to you do, 
you'll never, you're going to have bitterness and resentment. And you know what? It owns you. You don't own it. So mm-hmm. until you take responsibility, it owns you. You don't own it. And um, it does. It sucks. And it's tough to, to do it. And sometimes it's not fair. But when you own it, when you take responsibility, that's when you can control it. That's when things start to change. Mm. No, I like that. I really like that. Um, after we talked about success and stuff like that, and your, your pillars and everything you talked about and how there's different levels of success for people, um, I always try to talk about significance. Because for me, I live the life of success. I want to be significant. I want to leave that mark. How do you view significance in your life? Yeah, I think that's been a, that's been a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, I think starting out, you know, I always view significance from other people. You know, I want to get it from my, I want to, I want to feel significant because I want other people to think of me in a certain way. My family, um, my dad, dads, you know, uh, my friends, I want to be viewed, my peers. I want to be viewed as, as we just talked about success. I want to be viewed in a certain light. And because of that, that makes me significant. Mm. But um, as I've matured and, and aged, <laughs> um, you know, the, the thing is I have to remind myself, and I certainly don't think this all the time because that's a still struggle. That's, an, that's something that I constantly, I don't know that I'll ever, and hopefully I will, hopefully one day I won't struggle with that. But I, I think, I, I know I still struggle with, with finding significance, but I, what I remind myself is Ephesians 2.10, Hmm. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And my only true significance can come from my heavenly father. And if I'm searching for it for myself, if I'm searching for it through somebody else, I'm always going to end up empty. Yes. And that's a daily reminder. It's not like, Hey, once I read the verse and I, you know, memorize it, or do a Bible study on it that all of a sudden I feel significant for me. That's not the case. That's, that's a daily reminder that, you know what, I'm significant because he says I am. Mm, I like that. Um, a guy I used to follow and uh, try to surround myself with his name, is Steve Weatherford, um, Super Bowl champion. He always has this great quote and it's that when you know whose you are, you'll know who you are. And that is so truthful, brother. I mean, once you realize your worth and how precious you are to God, then you'll really stop chasing after. I mean, because a lot of times, and I want to tie this back in here, um, a lot of times the stuff that we didn't get from our father, the attaboy that we're always searching for and stuff like that, that leaves us with this void, this hole in ourselves, right? To where we're consistently seeking that from someone else, whether it be a job, whether it be whatever, you know, and we're constantly trying to fill that void. A lot of men, it's porn, it's, it's smoking, it's drinking and stuff like that. Right. And those are whole deeper issues that I don't want to really get into, but needless to say, we have that void. And when you really let God fill that void for you, man, you're going to stop all those things. You're going to start seeing how wonderful you truly are, you know, and stop viewing yourself through the lens of the world. Absolutely. You know, um, talking about all this, brother, I wanted to ask you, how did you balance like your success in home life? Like, can you help our listeners? Cause you're obviously you're a successful man. You know what I mean? Um, so how did you balance that within your home? Cause that's hard for a lot of people, especially tradesmen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, the, the, the body being balanced in business scenario, that's not my creation. <laughs> so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that was something that uh, I went through a program called the warrior's way that, that taught me that system. But mm-hmm. prior to that, um, I would say that I've always, I've always had a solid foundation in my faith. So I look back even at college, college years can sometimes, and I, and I wavered for sure, but it, growing up, growing up, um, in, in, in Birmingham and even in Selma, I was always in church to some extent, maybe not a lot, but I was always in church to some extent. And, um, and then went to college and drifted, but found myself back 
you know, wanting to grow in my relationship with, with Jesus. I didn't know that. I, you know, to me, it was like a, a the church was checking the box and, and all the time I had spent, no one had ever really told me that, no, this is a relationship thing. Like, this is why you do this. Uh, this is why you read the word and spend time in prayer. Like you don't just do it so you can check a box or memorize scripture or feel good about yourself. Like there's a relationship that happens because of that. And it was college before I really figured that out. And from that, from that was, was the, the foundation that I realized would really determine a lot of the choices I would make. So um, I believe that it's, that's what led me to Southeast Lyman Training Center. Um, mm-hmm. It's what led me to Birmingham to work for Alabama Power. Um, and how do I balance as a bit, that being the, the thing that matters most to me? I feel like my heart was always open to what God was leading me to do. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have like this, I didn't have it all figured out. I mean, I, listen, I would, the, 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 the good thing about it is I did want to be around my family as much as possible. I didn't have to travel a lot when we, we came up here working at, I'm working at a small business. That's really, we're just trying to, we're, we're at the bottom of the barrel trying to make payroll. I mean, at, at the end of the day, like I don't, I could share more about that, but you know, the reality is like, I had no clue <laughs> I mean, what I was doing when I, when I made this decision to come up here, um, but I did, and it was a lot of faith to do that. And, um, but I wasn't traveling. I wasn't on the road. I was home every, you know, I was home every night. So, um, but there still was a commitment that, you know what, I've, I'm going to be, when I'm at work, I'm going to be here and I'm going to work, but I, I, I still have an obligation to be with my family. I still have an obligation to myself. And so it, it really wasn't, there really wasn't a formula that was, um, that I can say, Hey, this, I had it all figured out. It just so happened that I think faith being really the core and the foundation for me led me, led me to, to, to make those decisions for my life. So when I have, when we have students here um, that graduate and and go on to take jobs and and listen, they can, they can go a lot of different paths. Um, I would say those that have a faith, and they feel like, hey, this is, this is, these are non-negotiables for me. Mm-hmm. That's going to direct the decisions they make. You know, are they going to be willing to, are they wanting to just go back to their hometown or are they willing to relocate or what is, what is that career path going to look like? And is that going to mean I'm going to be traveling on the road all the time? Or does that mean I'm going to be home at night? Um, and so for me, it's like faith ha- had to be the thing that kind of directed that path and kept that balance. And now it's, it's, um, it's easy for me to do that because, but as it's gotten busier, so the, the challenge is different. You know, the challenge early on was different than the challenge is now, now having kids and now trying to stay in, in good shape and, and, and still invest in my relationship with my wife and not let that drift apart because that's what, that's what happens. You get very comfortable in a marriage and you, you're, you're, you know, kids come into the mix and then all of a sudden now kids leave and then the relationship is gone. And I remember when I was, um, a very wise man, um, a mentor of mine used to tell me, just make sure you don't grow apart. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to grow apart. I love this woman. You know, like we're in love. I mean, I was 20 years old. We're in, of course, that's why I don't like, we're in love. You know, nothing's ever going to happen. Well, you know, I look at marriage, like it's like a construction zone, you know, it's like a constant construction happening and building and growing. And you know, you, you can't just, it doesn't just like, you don't, you can't ever coast. There's always work that has to be done. And, and people say, well, I don't love this person anymore. You chose not to love that person. Love is a choice. Yes. We choose love every single day. So I'm, I'm giving you the long answer, I guess, right? mm-hmm. from how I balance that commitment. But number one, I'll just sum it up being that, that my faith was, was critical uh, in that uh, decision-making process. And I, and I just wouldn't, I wasn't willing to compromise some, some um, certain things in my life mm-hmm. uh, for others. And, but, but a lot of what directed that path was my relationship with the Lord. Hmm. So your faith in Jesus Christ is what guided your moral compass to make the decisions, right? Yep. That were beneficial for your family, which caused you to be balanced. And I, and I, I agree with you a hundred percent, you know, even warriors of old samurais and stuff like that all had a balance. That's why they did origami. You know what I mean? <laughs> they had to find a balance 
and whether it be spiritual, or whatever for you, it was Jesus Christ. For me, it was Jesus Christ. And for our listeners, hopefully they'll receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and savior too. You know what I mean? But nevertheless, it's that balance. And I, you hit the nail right on the head with that brother. Um, I wanted to ask you, you talked about how different stages in your life, different challenges came, right? How did your family support the decisions you made? Yeah. So I will say some of the, my family, like my wife is, um, our relationship. And again, I look back and I'm going, Oh my gosh, how did, how did I get paired up with this person? Because at 20 years old, I'm only looking after, I'm only really look, I'm like, okay, personality check, good personality. She's beautiful check. You know, like I'm, I'm, oh, that's, oh, that's good enough. We'll get married. You know, it's like, yeah. we never, really, you don't really dive into, okay, what's going to happen 10 years from now when we start making decisions about our kids and we start to make decisions about life and we don't agree. Mm. Like, and so in my situation, like when we had one of the biggest challenges and I'll say, this is, this was, this is a massive challenge. The, and, and so my, fa- my father-in-law founded this school. So I came to work in 2000. It was st- First class was in 2000. So I really came, came to work for SLTC the first year in existence. So he's actually the one who founded SLTC, he and another gentleman. And, uh, and so I, I, I came to work for my father-in-law, which some people would say, that's just, that may be a really bad decision. I mean, my, my dad and my, my, my dad didn't really say much about it. My stepdad thought I was really stupid. He's like, you're leaving a you know, you're, you're leaving a fortune, I don't know, maybe a fortune 100 company. You're leaving a awesome company, Southern company, Alabama power, you know, and you're going to go work for your father-in-law in a trailer. Like son, like, come on. You mean, <laughs> I thought I'll raise you smarter than that. You know? <laughs> but my father-in-law was an entrepreneur and I want to learn business, you know, and, and I being growing up in a farm, I'm like, well, Hey, you know, I should have told him, Hey, you know, you raise me on a farm and then you stick me in downtown Birmingham in a cubicle, you know, and I'm like, you should have known that wasn't going to go over too well. So, um, I, I came up to, came to work here and, and, um, and that was, again, it's in 2000. And then in 2012, my in-laws decide they're getting divorced. Mm. So my George being my father-in-law, my mentor, one of the, closest man. I mean, he's another man in my life. Right. I mean, I, I looked at him almost like a, a dad. He was, um, in 35 years of marriage. And, uh, and now all of a sudden we lived across the street from them. I mean, I'll, we lived on family property. I mean, we built a, a house across the street. I mean, we were connected. My wife's best friend is her mother. Mm-hmm. So when this happened, you want to talk about the finance, you know, family dynamic. I mean, he's, he's on the board at a church and, you know, we're very involved. It was, it was a nightmare. Um, and how did my wife handle this? My wife and I, we talked about it and we, we had to, we had to be on the same page. It could have caused a disaster in our own, in our own marriage if we didn't agree. And I think what it came down to is number one, is that just about the grace of God that that we saw things the same, that she was supportive of me. Um, and I say this all the time too, it's her faith too. Like, I don't know how, you know, when you think about marriage and, and the challenges that are in marriage, you take, you take Jesus out of it. I don't know how, I don't know how anybody makes it without Jesus. Mm. So her relationship guided her, my relationship guided me. And, and we had trusted each other to do what we felt like was best for each other. And she supported me. And I supported my father-in-law. Now I didn't support what he did, but I supported him. You know, I was there for him. I was still working with him. And, um, and so, yeah, it caused a lot of tension in my relationship with my mother-in-law. Um, and, but that's restored because she's a believer. Mm-hmm. It's like when you put your eyes on Jesus, like things just get better. I mean, I wish our, you know, if people, if people in this country could just see that, you know, there's unity in Christ, period. I mean, there's just, there's this. I mean, you're, you'll find a way because there's, there's true love for each other. And um, so we got through it. But for her and I, it was, I had, I had people, I had people that were in the church that turned their back on me 
um, because they didn't agree with what I was doing. Just, just loving my father-in-law through the process. And, um, I turned to my family, um, who was not directly involved. Obviously my family doesn't, we're not here. Uh, they're outside of Birmingham and, and I would talk to them and I would just say, Hey, am I, am I doing the right thing? You know, I mean, I'm struggling here. Um, and so that was, that was, that was, that led me, honestly, um, it led me to seal fit, led me to, uh, you know, wake up warrior led me in a lot of different ways where it forced me to grow. So we talk about those challenges and those trials and those circumstances that we don't like, but I look back on it and I don't look back on it and, and regret it. I wouldn't want it for anybody to experience what I experienced through this process with, I mean, I thought this, I mean, we're talking to the Lyman school, we're talking to the school, maybe being split, maybe being having to be sold, like something that I had invested, you know, 12 years of my life at that point, 13 years of my life and in, into, uh, it was my, it was my other child, you know? And um, so there's a lot of things up in the air. Um, and you know what? My wife was, she was supportive. She was there with me. And, and uh, I'm not saying we, we hundred percent agreed all the time, but I think really her, her willingness to, to, um, to be in the word and, and to listen to the Holy spirit in her life and, and, and mine, you know, it kept us, it kept us together, kept us, uh, supportive of each other. And, and also communication too. I mean, without that, that ground of good open communication where she could come to you with her stresses and you can come to her and, and realize that there's actual mutual respect and trust between each other to share these, these things that are bothering each other. I think that played a, a major part with you guys as well and helped you guys out with your guys's issues that you guys saw together and overcame. Yeah, well, trust is everything. Because if if that trust wasn't there, I'd had nothing to draw from. Yep. So if if I if I'd have burned that trust bridge in the past, mm -hmm. this would have been a, a disaster because she wouldn't she wouldn't believe me. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy, you know. We talk about trust. It's so easy. It, it's for it takes so so long to gain. So easy to lose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Th there's a great quote that Jimmy Evans always says, and he's a pastor and. He says that trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's so true, you know, yes. um, I want to transition into SELTC. Okay. Which is the Southeastern Lyman's training center. You know, you've been talking about that a lot, um, not being a lineman, you know, and I kind of got the gist that your father-in-law might've been a lineman. Can you share how, how did you recognize the need for this type of schooling and how did that all take place? You know what I mean? Just kind of, wondering. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people do. Um, <laughs> and so what's crazy is, um, is my father-in-law was not a lineman. Oh, um, he was an entrepreneur. And so, uh, he had a business in Florida. He was a, a produce broker that he would sell by the tractor trader loads. Um, he would sell produce and they had mutual friends that lived here in, in Trenton, Georgia outside of Chattanooga, they, they had some friends that, uh, you know, that would come up here and some, some Florida friends. Okay. So George and his wife, uh, uh, Darlene, my mother-in-law would come up here and they would spend summers. So produce is, is obviously seasonal. So, uh, he would work and, you know, sell, and then he would come up here and, and spend some summers and, um, they travel to Tammy's, uh, they travel to Auburn games. Uh, she was a cheerleader at Auburn. And, uh, I walked on and, uh, played a couple of years there. So, um, he would go, they would go to Auburn games and, and just spend some time up here. And you know, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. So he's like, man, you know what? I'm up here a lot. Like this might be, I just might want to find something to keep me occupied. Well, a gentleman by the name of Randy Beckus and George started talking and, um, Randy was the industry. He was the industry professional. He's a guy that had been working for, uh, you know, in the, in the trade. And he approached George uh, about starting school and um, they talked about it. And I don't know all the dealings and what all came about, but uh, George thought it was a great idea. They bought 19 acres right here in Dade County and threw a trailer on a property. And, and, um, and Randy was like, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. And this is, this is, this is how it'll all work. And, 
for your listeners and stuff. And I don't know, you've probably if being in the trade, you probably know Northwest Lyman college. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so Aaron Howell, um, it, you know, Aaron Howell, uh, president of Northwest Lyman college and, and Randy had communicated. And I think early on, we're really looking at some kind of a uh, partnership. Um, and I met Aaron in, in Alabama at, at the, uh, Alabama power corporate headquarters, uh, in Birmingham because Randy brought him down and, um, and met Aaron there. And then we actually, when I came to work in November, 2000, we, we communicate with Northwest. So we would talk to Northwest, um, on a, on a, uh, fairly regular basis, maybe it was once a week, maybe once every couple of weeks. And, um, and then it got to the point where we realized we were kind of going our own ways. Um, and, and we didn't even see ourselves so much as competition back then, because I mean, we were, we were training like 12 people a class. I think they had maybe 50, 60 a class. They're all the way in Idaho. We're all, we're all the way here in North Georgia, but just busyness and life and, different, maybe different philosophies. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, didn't, didn't communicate as much, but, um, Aaron is, uh, Aaron's an awesome dude, man. Um, I got to spend a little time with him and, and Alan Drew's awesome. And, um, they built a great organization, but th that's really where a lot of the program from with his relationship with, um, with Randy and just communicating, Hey, 15 weeks, you know, this is, this is really how to make this work. But it was, it was definitely, it was definitely something that, that, um, you know, they had, they had proven the concept, um, worked and, uh, that's kind of how it got started, George and, and Randy. Uh, and then I came to work, like I said, in 2000. So I was in the third class, part of the third class. I didn't go through the third class, but, um, came up here as, as, uh, uh, you know, in the third class and my background was, was, uh, marketing. And uh, I had a business degree, and so uh, which basically means not a lot when you're graduating high college. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so well, I'll just learn the school of hard knocks here. Um, when you have no budget, you have no money, and you're trying to market and brand, um, pretty much try everything. And uh, yeah, just just literally. So the crazy thing about it is, at the time, I was young enough to not realize that it might not work. Mm. You know, it's like, um, you know, I was thinking George had this, you know, magic ball or, you know, this, this crystal ball. And he just knew that it was going to happen. It was going to work. And this is how it's all going to unfold. And um, so I had all my trust in him. And I think he was kind of trusting me because at the time he was still down, make, he was still doing produce. I mean, he wasn't even here. Mm -hmm. It was me and Randy here you know, in the business and, um, and, uh, our Dale Gaddis, which was another one of our instructors and it was just us up here. I mean, that was it. <laughs> so mm. I was running, I was doing basically marketing, recruiting and, and, uh, you know, any kind of financial aid and, and really just hustling to try to get guys in the seats, man. That was my job. Like get mm. them in the seats, find a way to get them here. Mm. Um, and we had a receptionist. I was a receptionist, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I was doing, doing anything in the office. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's just, just, and then I, you know, the reality is one, well, number one, it's, it's not knowing that not even thinking that failure was an option mm -hmm. and just continuing to grind and persevere. Um, and, and then on, honestly loving what we were doing, having a passion for what we were doing, even though I'm not a lineman, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you talked about me being kind of like, I mean, I am, I believe in, I want to improve people's lives. I see myself as a coach and a mentor, um, and a motivator teacher. So for me, I look at it and I go, then this is, this is equipping people for a great opportunity for a great career. Uh, I'm improving people's lives, even though I'm not directly out there training them how to climb poles. I'm mm -hmm. a part of this process and I believe in the process. So mm. it just, it's just, you know, doing the right things consistently over time. You know, I mean, putting our, putting our passion and our effort and our desire to, to, to make each class the best we can, uh, just continue to, to grow. And, and here we are. Dave, I wanted to ask you, do you feel that the students that come into this program, 
do you feel that they're fully aware of the sacrifices that they're going to be a make to, to be a part of this rewarding career? I mean, so do they, I mean, we do our best to, to let them know what the expectations are. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this is what it's going to be like. I mean, all of our, all of our, all of our trainers are journeyman line workers. You know, they've been doing this, some of them, you know, 30 years. So we don't sugarcoat it. I mean, that's the thing. Like, even, mm-hmm. even, if, even though they're talking to the girls on the phone, I mean, we are not, we are not telling them uh, that it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows and, and, you know, unicorns and, and all this great stuff. Like it's going to be tough and we're going to train in tough elements and situations. And, and, you know, if you're not willing to travel or relocate, um, you're going to, we tell them you're going to miss, you're going to miss birthdays. You're going to miss Christmas. You're going to miss Thanksgiving. Like this is the reality of this career. Um, and if you're not willing to do that, you you might need to think about it. You might need to think about something else. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I know it comes from, you know, it's, it's, I know that's our instructors and, you know, intent is to, to, to make sure they're prepared for this type Mm -hmm. of career. But, you know, as well as I do, you're 18 years old, you're 19, you're 20 years old. And, and, and 85% of our students are not married. So mm. they're not even thinking about that right now. All they're thinking about that, that new paycheck. truck and new time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're thinking about the paycheck. And so it's, it's hard to get into them that, hey, look ahead, understand what this is going to look like, um, you know, years down the road. And, um, you know, your life's going to change. Um, and it's going to be, and it's going to be tough. And I think that's probably why there are, there are, a large number of students probably five years from now that are not doing this trade. So even though we're, you know, we're grad, we've got a thousand students graduating a year. How many of those are in the trade, you know, three to five years from now, there's a lot that are probably transitioning out. And a lot of that may be because they don't end up, maybe they do have expectations that are unrealistic, mm-hmm. no matter how often you tell them until they get out there and they experience it. They're like, man, I didn't know it was going to be like this. You know, or I thought I was going to get a, you know, a job in my hometown, you know, or, you know, the local power company or, and that's just not the reality. So, um, but we, we, we try, we certainly try to yeah for it. Well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, with that being said, you know, obviously you, you talked about how it's a lot of young guys. Okay. One of the questions that I get dealt with, and I talk to a lot of linemen, a good friend of mine and our supporter at line one, one Gene Gloudman, he uh, is actually one of the assistant directors at Cal Nevada. Okay. Now I'm sure you're pretty familiar with Cal Nevada. They're like the Navy seals of apprenticeships. I mean, they're the best of the best. I mean, there ain't no joke about it. Those guys, you know what I mean? And uh, maybe I'm a little biased or whatever, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I could say that with great pride, they have a, a, an amazing program over there, what they're doing with their students. And uh, one of the things when I talk to linemen out there, the linemen are like, man, these kids, you know, I don't know what's going on with them, but it's like they wear their heart on their sleeve, mm. you know, and a lot of them have this entitlement. You know, I don't know if that's coming from like going through a training where they think, okay, I got certified, I'm climbing, I'm getting hot stick certified or whatever, you know what I mean? And now all of a sudden I get to this job site and now I think I can do everything and I burn the world down. You know what I mean? I don't know. And that's one of the questions that they ask me, what do you think? And for me, I think a lot of times these guys, like we talked about, they're after the money. They see the big paycheck. They see the three to four thousand dollar a week paycheck, whatever it is for an apprentice. I don't even know what it is now. Um, and they see that, and that's all they care about. You know, one of my line daddies always would tell me, "Don't worry about the money, Davy. It'll come. Try to learn as much as possible." Right. You know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I will tell you this: in twenty years of twenty plus years of being here. Mm -hmm. Um, the students have changed, you know, the culture has changed. Let's face it. I mean, I don't think it's a, 
you know, we've told them very, and again, I'll, I'll go back to even um, our relationship, even back with, we, we would, you know, communicate with Northwest Lyman a lot. It was the same problems. It's funny. We could, we can sit down and sit in a room and talk about like their issues and our issues and they're all the same. It's the same things. They, they battle with the same things we do with the, with the, with the you know, students coming in. Um, and we would always talk about guys, be humble, mm. you know, go into the job site, be humble, find, find value, create, create value for yourself. You know, you're going in there. You don't feel like you don't feel like you don't act like, you know, everything. You don't know anything. I mean, again, it's uh, the instructors we have here. If they say it one time, they say it a thousand times. And it is like, you know, you can be 10 years in this trade, still not know Jack when it comes to certain aspects of line work. Like you're, you're constantly learning and growing. Mm -hmm. Don't act like you've got it together. So they're hearing that. Um, I think a lot of it just is, you know, it's, it's not something that we're going to, we're trying to fix it in 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, in 15 weeks, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to unprogram 18 to 20 years of, of a mentality and a thought process and a culture. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? There's still hope because I, I still see characteristics of guys today. They're still choosing to get into this trade. They're still choosing to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but it, it is, it is a little challenging because the things the how hard we could be on the guys, the tough love that we could give them 10 years ago, can't give them, you can't give the same tough love today. No. You know, it's not the same. It's not received the same. Um, but that's the, that's, that's, we also, we also see that it's very important for us that when, when, a, in, when a student graduates SLTC, they can't just know the work. There has to be intangibles that they have, you mm -hmm. know, there has to be, there has to be those things that allow them to be an asset to that crew, you know, and, it's the soft skills that you don't, you don't hear about. You know, I mean, we, we want them to, again, show up, be there on time, do what you're told, be safe. Like um, details matter. Um, you know, just having the ability is great, but there's so much more than that that comes with, you know, being here. And so we do feel obligated. We do feel like it's our responsibility and being good stewards in that 15 weeks to do our, to do our part and try to train up as best we can. It's not just, Hey, can we check a box and can you do all these things? And then we're going to send you out there, the industry. Mm -hmm. That's not really, that's not it. I mean, there are so many things we're trying to instill in these guys in 15 weeks, much more beyond that, mm -hmm. you know, do the skill. That's fine. But, but how are you going to be when you're on that crew? How well are you going to be received on that crew? You know uh, it's, it's really, it's really critical. Cause a lot of these guys, again, aren't the instructors, they know who they would want to work for or mm -hmm. work with. Like if this was an apprentice on my crew, you know, I mean, we, we give them that, uh, that ability. So we have what we call a behavior assessment. We have a point system and instructors can terminate students, not just based on grades, but based on points, based on uh, failure to uh, advance, failure to uh, progress. Uh, could be attitude, could be, you know, safety, could be a number of different things, leadership. And those instructors we, we make sure that I'm like, listen, this is your guy. Like he's leaving here and he's, he's your guy. Like you, you can't, he came here and 15 weeks later, he's leaving here and yeah, he's an SLTC graduate, but guess what? He's a graduate of your group, which means he's wearing your brand on him. Mm. Now if you're not willing to put him out there and say, you know what? And vouch for him to say, he gets, this is a guy that I would want on my crew. This is a girl that I would want on my crew. Then why did you, why did you not have the hour conversation? You know, and I'm, it's not a perfect system. No. It's never perfect, but it is something that we really strive to continue to work through and, and, and get as close to perfect as we can, because we want to make sure that the individuals that we're putting out there are, are going out and that and going to the industry um, again, with more than just a skill set. Yeah, no, that's awesome that, you do that. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't teach character, you know, yeah. and, and another thing I've learned too, with the apprentices that I've had is you can't teach common sense. You know what I mean? And just because you want the paycheck, because you want the title doesn't necessarily mean that this career is for you. You know, I, I don't know how many apprentices I've met 
it's like, dude, just go away. You know what I mean? Just go away. This isn't for you. You've been thrown out three or four times and they got it in their head. No, I can do this. I can do this. You know what I mean? And it's like the world needs ditch diggers too, you know, and, and not, not to be mean or anything like that, but you know, there's this job isn't for everybody, you know, but it's good to see that you guys are trying to raise men, you know, yeah. and you talked about mentorship and stuff like that. It seems like at Southwest or Southeast Lyman training center, you, that's what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to give them more than just skills, you know, you're doing life skills, you know? So I just want to thank you, brother Dave, for coming on here, brother. I mean, it, it was such an honor to have you on here, dude. You're such a solid dude. And I look forward to talking to you more and uh, just picking your brain a little bit about, you know, what you guys do and stuff. And uh, I appreciate you. I really do. How can people get a hold of you? Can you share with our audience? If they want to find yeah, you. Yeah. So I mean, you want to find me, uh, obviously lineworker.com is our website for Southeast Lyman Training Center. Um, I think uh, Instagram, Facebook, it's all, I think, David V. Powell. So you can look me up there. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm open to, any, you know, any questions or comments or conversations. And uh, I, I appreciate you having me on, David. This is, this is awesome. Love what you're doing and totally believe 100% in what you're doing. And a lot of men need this, you know, our, our next generation of kids need this. They need fathers to be present and be around. And uh, so I'm looking forward to a continued relationship for sure. All right on, David. God bless, brother. Thank you. Yes, sir.